drones, doorbell cameras, CCTV, and your rights. This is what we're talking about in this video because I get more than a few queries about it, so let's talk about it. Welcome back to the channel. So I get more than just a few questions, queries, comments, arguments, you name it, underneath my videos, both here and on TikTok. Yes, I am on TikTok as well. I've got over 120 something thousand followers. So if you are a TikToker, go and check that out as well. Apparently TikTok thinks I don't have enough followers to be verified. Anyway, I'm verified on YouTube. So here's where I do the bulk of my content. So I get lots of these questions and lots of debate arguments as to whether or not the data protection laws and the retained version of the UK GDPR applies to householder cases for CCTV, doorbells, and dash cam footage, drones, and all of this sort of stuff. So I'm covering those in this video. But also, uh, a discussion, we'll call it, just recently as to whether so-called citizen journalists, as some refer to as auditors, come within data protection laws, GDPR, and whether or not they're acting in the course of business. Now, I've got a reasonably definitive view on this, and I don't think a court would disagree with me. And I'll explain what it is and why, so make sure you watch to the end. So first of all, look, look at our ring doorbells and nest doorbells. I've tried both, by the way. They're both pretty good. They do record and store other people's data if they are walking by outside of the curtilage of your property, because invariably, it's not just going to be trained on your driveway. It's going to, in the distance at the very least, capture somebody walking past. Now, the important thing to note here is that if it is capturing people walking past outside of the curtilage of your property, the data protection laws are going to kick in if that person is going to be readily identifiable. And the chances are they will, because it's not going to be too far away that they won't be identifiable. If they're not, then it doesn't really make a difference. But in most cases, they are going to be identifiable. Now, if you're also recording audio, that makes it even more problematic. Now, I've received some fairly alarming, quite frankly, comments and questions about neighbours recording by way of CCTV and such things, children playing in their garden, as in the neighbour's garden. I don't think you need a lawyer to tell you that that is wrong and shouldn't be happening. But in the strictest of sense, of course, data protection laws will kick in because this is going to be more than is reasonably necessary to capture that is outside of the curtilage and the bounds of your own property. Let's say for argument's sake, you're trying to protect a fence and you're trying to record anybody that's climbing over that fence because you're getting burgled and you want to record them in the act, as it were. If you're recording that fence and you have a mere slither of your neighbor's garden, that's one thing. If, on the other hand, you've got quite a wide view of your neighbor's garden, including when children come out to play, for example, and you're filming them and you can pick up the audio of their conversations and all this sort of thing, this is going to be more than is reasonably necessary to achieve the objective of you putting up the camera in the first place and it's going to be capturing your neighbor's garden. Therefore, data protection laws are going to kick in. Now, there is authority for this, and there is also some fairly good guidance by the ICO, uh, which I will try to bring up on screen now. Um, for domestic CCTV systems, the ICO provides a fairly comprehensive guide for CCTV, what to do if you're unhappy about it, and all of this sort of thing. Now, obviously, the main things it it talks about to begin with, I'll contact the person, ask why they're using it, explain your concerns, try to be neighborly and all this sort of stuff. But sometimes that just isn't going to work. However, the data protection laws will kick in and require them to follow certain rules. Now, this is because if you are capturing anybody outside of the bounds of your own property, then it's no longer considered to be, or no, not necessarily considered to be, a wholly household activity. Now, a wholly household activity is exempt under GDPR because it's your own purposes. 
For example, if you were to covertly record a conversation with an insurance company because you want a private record of your conversation with that insurance company, therefore you want to recall that conversation, you want a contemporaneous record of precisely what was said to and by uh, the insurance company, you can do that. You don't need their permission. You're not breaking any laws. It's permitted within um, the data protection law because under GDPR, it's a wholly household activity. It is exempt from GDPR. Unless you then publish that online, then it's not necessarily a wholly household activity any longer, and you would need some other kind of reason. Other reasons might be it's a public interest, it's uh, protecting some kind of, against some kind of crime or whatever, but in which case you'd be better off reporting it to the police and various other things. So you, your best is going to be some kind of public interest. Even then, you're going to have to take steps to ensure that you're protecting the identity of certain individuals and whether they can be identified, taken together with any other information and so on and so forth. And again, there is a case that um, dealt with exactly this. There was a, um, a lady who was ordered to uh, delete photographs of her grandchildren that she'd posted on Facebook and Pinterest without the parents' consent. This was in the Netherlands. This was because whilst GDPR does not apply to purely or uh, purely personal or household processing of data, it didn't apply in this case because posting of the photographs on social media made them available to a wider audience, the court said. And therefore, with Facebook, it cannot be ruled out that the placing of the photographs may be distributed, may end up in the hands of third parties. And she was ordered to remove the photographs and pay a fine of around £45 per day that she failed to comply with the order. So in that situation, she was ordered to remove the photographs and pay a fine for every day that she didn't uh, remove those photographs. That's because it took it outside of the bounds of being a purely personal or household activity. So the situation vis-a-vis -vis doorbells and recording, if it is recording people outside of the curtilage of your property, you have to comply with data protection laws, which means it's got to be kept securely, no longer than is necessary, no more than is necessary and not used for any other purpose than is necessary and for which it was collected in the first place. And there was a case I did a very deep dive into, which I will link in the description below if I remember, if I forget, tell me and I will put it up, um, which dealt with exactly this, where somebody was using footage captured by these cameras and there were several cameras set up on the shed, on the fence, on the windowsill and so on. And they were being used to intimidate and harass the neighbour and the claim was brought and it was a test case. A uh, circuit judge took the case and said, I am going to make this a test case and did so. So you need to be careful that you comply with these laws. Now, the ICO's position is that you don't need to register for data protection as an individual in these situations, but you do need to comply with the law. How does that apply to dash cams? Well, it's not a fixed camera in the eyes of the ICO. So um, they talk about dash cams. Uh, these rules only apply to fixed cameras. They do not cover rooming cameras such as drones or dashboard, as long as the drone or dash cam is used only for your domestic or household purposes. So starting with dash cams and drones, generally, they seem to be okay, because as long as they are used only for your domestic and household purposes, and that might include, it might include, uploading them for some kind of interest and analysis and so on. But if it crosses a threshold, now this is my view, it's not been definitively ruled upon by a court, but I have a view on it. My view is that if someone were regularly uploading dash cam footage and drone footage and using it on a channel to generate revenue, that is no longer, in my view, a wholly personal or household purpose, meaning data protection laws do kick in. So how does that apply when I use a snippet of somebody's dash cam footage or our friend Ashley Neal, if you're not familiar, I'll link him in the description below. Um, and um, also Charlie Veach when he's walking around filming and, and putting people on there as well. Let's look at some of those situations. I'll link them both in the description below. Make sure you go subscribe to them as well. Now, there are different ways of um, 
filming things and using things and how the data protection laws apply. Now, if someone is incidentally captured, let's say in the case of Charlie Veach walking around, someone is incidentally captured, well, it's incidental, so it doesn't really matter. If they engage with him in conversation and it then becomes a sort of live event, then yes, the data protection laws are going to kick in. But if it is a sort of journalistic piece for the sake of the video, then so long as that is used for that purpose and no more than that purpose, i.e. he doesn't go back and you know, start researching them, and sending them more emails and staying in touch with them and, you know, beyond what it was originally captured for in the first place. Then again, probably, okay. Um, our friend Ashley Neal um, very often uses dashcam footage and I very often use dashcam footage. Again, it's in the public domain. Ordinarily, if it were just any sort of random member of the public, uh, using dash cams um, for their own recording purposes, it's wholly personal or it's household. As soon as it goes onto a YouTube channel, for argument's sake, if we were to be following the uh, Netherlands ruling with the grandmother posting photographs to uh, Facebook, um, then that would take it out potentially of the personal and household exemption and therefore data protection laws would kick in. And it would then be a question of what you've captured. Is it any more than necessary? Is it being stored securely? Is it being uh, used for any purpose beyond that that it was originally captured for in the first place? Now, clips that are submitted by members of the public to, let's say, Ashley Neal or to myself or whatever, we are adding something to it, usually. We are commenting on it in some sort of education uh, sense, um, some kind of a view, public interest, and all of these kind of things. So that provides a reason for using that footage. Is it more than necessary? No, it's only enough to comment on the video itself. It might be a public interest in the sense that we're providing an opinion as to who was right and wrong in that situation. And Moreover, we're not using that information. We're not digging deeper and then contacting the people and all of these kind of things. Unless, of course, um, it's someone that's asked for our contact and all, all that sort of thing. Otherwise, uh, we are not using any of that information for more than it was necessarily uh, gathered for in the first place. But it does mean that if you are filming for any of those purposes then data protection laws do kick in. Now, there's one or two videos I've commented on previously where a business has been, it was a, a food stall, was filming the process of every, each and every customer buying the food and then walking off. And that was broadcast live, presumably in the hopes uh, or actual fact of gaining some ad revenue, something like that. Now, as a business filming its customers, if that was the purpose of filming them in the first place, to me, that is beyond what is reasonable because every customer comes up to the counter wouldn't reasonably expect to be filmed and then broadcast online for everybody to see. That's just not what you would expect. Whereas, going back to Charlie Veach, for example, you walk up to somebody with a with a camera. I note that in I, I check out some of his videos now and again um, in my research for what I'm doing on this channel. And more often than not, I recall, at least in Charlie's case, saying, I'm a YouTuber, I'm filming for YouTube, I'm making a video to put on my YouTube channel. I noticed some of the others do that as well. It's then quite clear that anyone anyone coming up that they are being filmed that they might end up on YouTube. And that's quite clear from the outset. If they didn't want to appear in the video, they could just walk away. Even in the situation where some situations you might not agree with where they approach a building, or people come out. Again, they're coming out into public. They're being filmed. They're being told they're being filmed in the most cases for the ones that I watch. And 
they have a choice to stick around and have the conversation knowing they're being filmed and having been told that it will be put on YouTube or go back in the building and have nothing more to do with it. That's their choice then. But being out in public, out in the open, if that is the purpose that they're being filmed in the first place and it's known to them, then broadly speaking, I don't really see an issue with that. There might be an issue if it's continued harassment and so on, but we come into all sorts of other discussions there. Uh, if someone were coming back to the same building again and again and again, that might be a different story. But overall, that's the position with doorbells, with dash cams and with drones. Some people might object to how they are stored and incidentally captured. Uh, that's by the by. If you're incidentally captured and you're out in public, there's no automatic right and certainly no absolute right of privacy in a public place. Although the Court of Appeal has made it clear that it does depend on the circumstances. So you can use your imagination. There might be certain situations out in public where somebody may find a quiet corner and just not want to be filmed. And uh, to protect people's dignity and these kind of things, I'm telling you that the court will, in certain situations, the court will attribute a reasonable expectation of privacy and you'd be expected to use a bit of judgment, a bit of sense to stop filming in those situations. So there it is. Uh, for some that believe that the data protection laws don't apply at all, that's obviously not true. That's not the case. They can apply to your home CCTV and to uh, businesses using, certainly businesses using fixed CCTV, uh, such as the, the ones I've mentioned, filming customers coming up to buy food and so on. Um, that's not to say you can't install them. You know, you can install your CCTV cameras uh, all the way around the property and do that. Um, but just be aware that these laws do apply and you can face claims if you're handling uh, data incorrectly, more than is reasonable, more than is necessary. And certainly if you're using it for purposes other than that which it was gathered for in the first place. So I'm sure you have lots of thoughts, lots of comments about all of that. Um, probably more questions. This is a subject that usually f fires up more questions than it does answers. Um, although I hope to provide you uh, with a stream of answers in these videos. But there it is, a very broad overview for your discussion, your enjoyment, your education. Please make sure you like this video before you disappear. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. I am very grateful to you all for 275,000 subscribers now. My next mini goal is 300,000 and my main goal is 1 million subscribers to help 1 million people understand law. Thank you so much for watching. Mm -hmm.